Okay, so once again, a very warm welcome to everyone who has come to attend the talk and a very special thank you and a welcome to our speakers today. Um, so I will introduce quickly our, sub, our uh, you know, academic group, which is called Delhi Comparatists. Uh, this basically is an initiative in the direction of studying the uh, Indian literary scenario uh, with themes of transmediality and interdisciplinarity serving as the cornerstones. We started in 2010. Uh, it's an initiative by the teachers and students of University of Delhi. And the primary thrust of this group is to develop a critical understanding of the cultural and social political dynamics uh, of a multicultural landscape like India. So our research forums include subgroups like uh, literary historiography, diaspora studies, transmediality studies, digital humanities, rhetoric studies, and so on. And we have successfully online, uh, organized online talks under each one of them in the past mm -hmm. one year. So we empathetically endeavor to create a sustainable and socially relevant hub that engages with and enhances the tools, methodology, theory, and approaches which are analogous to these dynamically interactive areas of study. So this is in a nutshell what Delhi Comparatives does. Uh, I would request Srimoy to now uh, take over and introduce her uh, research forum, which is Diasporic Studies, and our distinguished speakers today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Charu, for uh, introducing Delhi Comparatist. Uh, as, and you're right, like one of the subgroup is working on diaspora and memory studies, and I'm a part of that. And I'm really proud to work with this group because the members are so active and they, they have like always uh, enticing questions and feedbacks and suggestions about it. And the primary purpose of uh, organizing these uh, lectures is to ensure a dialogue between various disciplines. Uh, by in, uh, by engaging the scholars who are from multiple focused areas and we uh, like after each lecture we sincerely hope that the discussion that follows these lectures and the talks is really going to provide a new dimension to the way uh, the comparative uh, study function today and now i would like to introduce our speakers uh, so our first speaker professor marian hish she writes about the transmission of memories of violence across generations combining feminist theory with memory studies in global perspectives. Her recent books include The Generation of Post-Memory, Writing and Visual Culture After the Holocaust, 2012, Ghosts of Home, The Afterlife of Chernowitz in Jewish Memory, 2010, and School Photos in Liquid Time, Reframing Difference, 2019, both co-authored with Leo Spitzer and the co-edited volume Women Mobilizing Memory, 2019. Hirsch teaches comparative literature and gender studies at Columbia University in New York and is a former president of the Modern Language Association of America, as well as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Our second speaker, Martha Kupferman, is an Argentine multidisciplinary artist who was born in Buenos Aires, daughter of Auschwitz survivor parents, mother from Hungary and father from Poland. The history of exile and migration of her parents marked her life and art she is a lecturer and teacher, exhibiting since 1977, had more than 100 solo shows. She has received many local and international awards and recognitions. Martha built a memorial to honor the victims of the terrorist attack of the Jewish community, building AMIA in Buenos Aires in 1994. She searches uh, into her family history in order to draw out of those sources, metaphors that go beyond the peculiarities of individual experience. Her recurring topics are identity, memory, migrations, human rights, and language. Uh, she launched in 2015 and is the current director of LABABA, a laboratory for Jewish culture in Buenos Aires as part of the LABA Global Net in New York City, East Bay, Berlin, Toronto, and Buenos Aires. Now, I'd really like our speakers to take the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shri, and uh, thank you all for inviting us and for joining us for this conversation. Um, it's wonderful to be here in this group and to hear about your work and the ways in which you've been able to get together um, during the pandemic and have these conversations and really move the field of comparative literature, comparative literary studies forward in these truly interdisciplinary ways. And, I think what we can contribute is really an interdisciplinary intermedial process um, by offering you a conversation between 
me as a scholar of memory and diaspora and Mirta Kupfermink as an artist and ways in which we can work together and inspire each other, uh, which we've been doing for the last, um, last few years, really having very intense conversations that have crossed large geographical divides, even though we, have, we share a history, uh, family history in the same part of the world, which is um, Eastern Europe, uh, largely conceived, um, Jewish Eastern Europe, and we're both um, children of survivors of the Holocaust. Um, Mirta is, lives in Argentina and I live in the United States and we only met a few years ago, but uh, we share this um, history, but we also share, I think, a certain way of approaching the subject of family history and of memory and of diasporic lives. So I'm going to share my screen and Rita, I don't know if you want to say anything in in uh, no, just introduction. Thank just to thank and please continue, Marianne. I will follow. Okay, we're good. we have a little PowerPoint mm -hmm. in which we're going to talk about the work, our work. On, and what we've entitled this conversation, Post Memory Art and Archive. So I wanted to start just briefly um, thinking about what we inherit from the past. And I know that for all of you um, coming from families that have lived through Indian history and the you know, legacies of the partition and of, you know, more, uh, of colonization, I mean, maybe you can relate to some of the things we're going to be talking about. So this is a little tiny book. This is my hand, so you can see how small it is. Um, that was part of the legacy of a cousin of mine whose father was a doctor in a concentration camp in Romania during the Second World War. It was mainly a concentration camp for political survivors. And as a doctor, he diagnosed a disease that many, many of the inmates of the camp uh, suffered from, which was a kind of a paralysis uh, of their entire body and then internal organs, many died. And the paralysis was caused by a certain pea that was used to make their food, uh, soups and breads and everything, a chickling pea. Uh, the local guards did not eat this food uh, and it was known that this could be poisonous for humans, but um, there were a number of doctors in the camp and it took a, a while for them to diagnose what was going on and what the cause was. Eventually there was a hunger strike um, and there was an inspection and the camp uh, was closed. And he was then um, uh, relocated to another camp. Um, and when he was leaving the camp, some of the, his patients made him a gift. And the gift was this little book. And it was a little book filled with, these are individual pages a little book filled with drawings that told the story of, um, of these people and their treatments. You see the food here, you see the train, you see the uh, examination by the doctor. And uh, in some of these drawings, you see crutches because they had to wear, wear uh, use crutches. Very different styles. There are five different artists. Um, you, each one of them ends either with, uh, you know, the the departure of train or the liberation. You see the word liber here at the, in Romanian at the bottom of this one. Um, more about food and about crutches and about um, some images that are very, very hard to read. Um, so this is this, is this, little, this little object. And again, the, at the end, you know, the, the, the artist drawing on his bunk and then the train with a big question mark, what, what is the future, where are we going? So this tiny, tiny little object was a legacy of, of this cousin of mine and um, so many questions. What do you do with objects like this? What do you do to carry these stories forward as a scholar, as a, as a child of, of survivors? What's our responsibility? What are our debts? to the survivors of catastrophic histories and catastrophic di diasporic history. Is there a possibility of repair, um, uh, of repairing a history in which we had no part, right? Um, and of what kinds of truths need to be told about it? How can we carry the voices of these survivors forward? So this has occupied me through 
many of the last decades really in my work in a number of books, uh, Sheree mentioned some of them, um, in which I've been thinking about memories, about inherited memories, about the transmission of memory across generation from theoretical perspectives and memory studies and psychoanalysis, but also in literature and visual arts and specifically photographs actually as carriers um, of memory. And uh, a lot of research also into the camp that this little book came from, but mainly just lots of questions um, about um, how to deal with these archival objects. And in doing so, one of the things that's really helped me is to go to the work of artists who have taken some of these archives and have done, you know, have reframed them, have rethought them, have taught me how to think about them. And one of these artists is Mirta Kupfermink, and this is the first work of hers that I encountered, which is called En Camino on the Road, um, that has really helped me define what I've come to call post-memory, which is the inherited memory of um, descendants of survivors of catastrophic histories that, um, that is an experience that's different from history because it feels very personal. It feels like memory, but it's not memory. It was not me. It could have been me, but it was not me. Um, I was not in that camp, but there's something about the way that history has come down to me that feels very powerful and that feels like my life has been somehow shaped by a history that I did not myself live. And I, Mirta and I are the same generation and we've done that. And what this image really shows me is first of all, the experience of diasporic lives. What do we do when we leave the places that we've been able to call home, but that have, from which we've been expelled, right? What do we carry with us? What do we take with us? And these, archi these archives are being carried on the backs of these figures, right? They bring their whole village with them. They bring their libraries, they bring their books, they bring their windmills and they carry their, the trees and try to transplant them. Actually, they become the trees. They become the roots of the trees. So this is really um, a work that so inspired me to think about transmission, about archives and about what art can do in the face of, of catastrophe. So. In the spirit of conversation, I wanted to invite Mirta to speak a little bit about this work and tell us what, how you came to it and what, you know, in what ways it was personal for you when you made it and how it's evolved. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you to all of us, to all of you uh, for inviting us again. <clears throat> Sorry, I apologize for my voice. It is much nicer, but I, am, I have throat issues but I'm quite well, thank you. Okay, actually we met Marianne, I remind you through this work, through this work. And uh, I must confess that uh, when I did it, when I was hearing now Marianne talking about this little, little book that was made, I realized with a different aim of the one I work with, because the book was just to thinking that they will not, they would not survive just to leave a testimony without aspirations of artistic aspirations. That is completely different way in which I approached uh, my words. Um, this work was actually made in the year 2001 when many young people in Argentina left Argentina uh, searching, looking for once again, a better place to, to live. Among these youngsters that were living, uh, two daughters of my husband also left. And I was very touched by this situation because uh, their grandfather arrived from Poland in Argentina, expelled, expulsed uh, from Poland after uh, the Holocaust also to find here in Argentina a better place to live in. And suddenly I realized that his granddaughters are living again. So I made this work as a, let's say, very contemporary feeling 
And uh, I must say that after meeting Marianne and Leo Spitzer and having so deep and um, then meaningful conversations to me, um, I realized that it is always a permanent feeling, these migration feelings that continues and uh, unfortunately uh, it seems not to, to get to an end. So this is an etching for the, the ones that are interested in techniques. I, I work with many different techniques. This is a metal etching. And well, as Marianne uh, described, this was the beginning, but this is a very, this turned to be a very iconic, let's say, work uh, for me. Marianne, if you can please uh, give me the next one. Marianne is honoring me because she made, she put it this image. She has it in the back in her home. So thank you. So uh, this work with this character. You have to admit it's incredible. So who would not <laughs> want it on their wall? <laughs> thank you. This, this image is quite new. This was made three years ago, actually for an a scenography of a theater play. You can see in the right side a, a, a city in, in Europe and a European city. And in the left side, a, the Puerto de a Buenos Aires port. So these characters continue wondering where to go. They are traveling from one place to the other and uh, always in time. They began walking perhaps before 2001 when I drew them, but they are uh, like symbolic characters to me. And in the next one, please, Marianne. Thank you. This is another version. I always say that I will make an exhibition only with the different versions of these car wandering characters, because this was made after the, the previous one. And this um, is based on a concept, uh, on a philosophy that um, many of you may know, Hintsugi, it's a Japanese tradition philosophy a very old one that meant that said that when a vase, a ceramic vase was broken, they didn't fix it to um, not to be seen the scratches, but uh, on the contrary, they tried to make them more beautiful because the marks in your life uh, show the history. So this uh, work is uh, titled Archaeology of a, um, of a, 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 a journey. journey. A journey. Thank, you. Thank you very well. But it is history, and that nothing. It's it has a a, a resilience a feeling. Is try to join all our pieces. Try, and I am speaking of myself. Trying to to recognize who I am everywhere where I am and uh, not to forget because I cannot forget what remains there, uh, but to, to, be a, to build a new constructions. Thank you. So, you know, this trajectory of this work really helps me, has helped me to think more about post-memory and what it is. The, the fragmentary nature is so perfect. The fragments don't really fit together, but as you know, subsequent generations, we try to fit them together. We try to fit them into a story. Um, it's a journey. It's an archeology span of a journey, but what is the journey? We, he, here we see where they're traveling from. They're traveling from Europe, Prague, right? Uh, to Buenos, to the port of Buenos Aires. But um, the, the ship is not really facing toward Buenos Aires. It's facing forward toward us. It doesn't really know where it's going. It's really become a kind of a symbol or, or um, you know, icon of the eternal traveling, but also of the current situation of migrants across the world, right? Who are also bringing their trees with them 
um, and uh, have become <coughs> rootless and have not been able to, to put down roots again because now they're on the sea where these trees cannot, can, cannot be rooted. So what do we do as descendants to try uh, to give them a home, to try to repair the situation? Um, we cannot uh, cover over the, um, the fragmentary nature of it. And also this no longer fits into a frame. We have to create new frames to create new worlds. And this is really, to me, this, this particular um, Kintsugi image shows the difficulty and the beauty of trying to reinvent over and over, but we don't want, also do not want it to be aestheticized in a way that, that, that no longer carries the pain. But look at the boat, look at the, look at the um, rusting of this boat that's just been in the water for too long. So, I mean, I, this, is, this is so much, there's so much to think about here. But I wanted to move to a different archive and to a different conversation that we've had, which has actually turned into a collaboration. And this was, um, Leo and I visited Buenos Aires and we were working on our book on school photos, uh, which turned into the book on school photos in liquid time. And we were particularly um, uh, preoccupied by these images from the ghetto in Wuj which actually touches Mirta very personally, and she will talk about her own history with, um, with that, that city and that ghetto. And this is uh, an image of school children waiting for, um, for food. As you can see, they're wearing the yellow star. And it's an image that's part of a large set of slides by a Nazi photographer, uh, Walter Genewein, um, who was the accountant of this ghetto, but also was an amateur photographer. And what became obvious to, to me in relation, and you see here he's counting money. Um, what became obvious to, to, to us as we were thinking about this incredible image of, uh, of the school children was how much of the history, of, certainly of the Holocaust, but how much of histories generally come down to us through perpetrator archives. So I showed you the little book that was really made by the prisoners in the camp with you know, very primitive kinds of um, materials uh, and tools. But here we have uh, the ghetto uh, accountant, a Nazi who was an amateur photographer and who took many, many slides um, of ghetto life, not to document the ghetto, not to humanize uh, his subjects, but primarily actually to experiment with color. Film is very, very early color stock between ACFA and Kodak, and he had access to ACFA color stock, and he kept writing letters to ACFA saying, uh, I'm not happy with the color, you know, the green is too green and the brown is too brown. And these um, two sets of uh, 300 slides were um, found after the war. There were two sets of them, one in a flea market in Frankfurt and one was found by a soldier and is now in the Holocaust Museum in, in, uh, by an American GI. Um, and one is in Jerusalem, in, in Tel Aviv and one is in Washington DC. But it's really the nature of perpetrator archive that um, and, and specifically photography, who takes the picture with what aim um, that became preoccupying. And when we met in Buenos Aires, we were um, talking about the children and how in photographs often we think of the photographer, we think of the viewer, but um, as the photography theorist Ariela Azulay so rightly says, the photograph person is always there. How do we imagine the photograph person and what the photograph person was looking at, thinking about, dreaming about, hoping for, afraid of, what were these children looking at? And through our conversation, um, we were thinking, how can we bear witness, bear witness to them? How can we be present for them? And how does that teach us to look at images taken by perpetrators and bond with not the gaze of the photographer, but the look back of the subject? So this was our question to Mirta, and you will see what she did with it. 
Thank you, Marianne. Well, I must say that now I realize when we are speaking that every conversation we have opens new doors and the doors. Uh, this is one of the work works that I made for that exhibition school photos under after life that Marianne and Leo Spitzer uh, curated, organized and thought. And um, now I realize that what I in this uh, from this work is uh, being born now all a new project that I am developing based on this li little girl that came out of that photograph. So the story never ends. And also I realized that the, um, the trees, that these, uh, these characters, these people are holding and carrying through the world are perhaps born from the first time from this tree that is down in the real photo that is my father's siblings in which in the photo, that photo exists, I have it. So um, uh, uh, many, many, many uh, new ways, new roads open from that photo. And if we go now uh, to the next photo that was part of the exhibition um, in Dartmouth College in the Hood Museum. So um, trying to, to empathize with the question with the conversation that we had with Marianne and Leo when they were saying, oh, those, those children were there standing, <coughs> were, were there, um, we all uh, used to take them in a passive way, but they were also looking at something and they were seeing what was happening in the ghetto. So trying to empathize with that a feeling with that thought, I, um, I must say that I worked during one year with this image that now we are seeing it in, in uh, our computers. It is small, but it is a very, very a big image, two meters and a half tall. And uh, this was really a made based on archives. It was a very, I must say, it, it was a, a visual essay for me because I didn't draw, just draw things, but I was based exclusively in, well, not exclusively, I will say where I created the images, but based on archives. For example, I tried to represent Genevan that Marianne just named with this lens of the camera, not with a face, not with a human representation, not the outside figure, but the feeling that the children had. This is drawn from the point of view of the children. The, the children saw that, um, that with power, in a position of power. So I represented with that lens that I researched what a kind of camera and lens Genevine or at that time Germans uh, used to have. There were not the same cameras as and, and, and photo uh, rolls that um, Jewish people had inside the ghetto. So they, uh, all the, the color photos we have access now are Nazi, uh, Nazi, Nazi photos. So the, this big lens uh, represents Genevan. All the back of the children that you can see in the bottom of the image, they didn't exist. I didn't have that photo. I invented that this I created based on real pieces of uh, uh, photographs in the archives. I joined textures and drew with that little, little files, this back of the children. And, well, the lines, the color lines represent all what, what Marianne described with the aqua colors and so on. And this a phantom transparent back big image that you can see in the right, in the right part, the big one. No, no, here in the lower part, Marianne, please. Ah, this, the, yes. Uh, yes, yes, the big one. You can one. see my cursor, right? Yeah. 
yes, with the back transparent behind, it represents someone that was a prisoner in the Wuch ghetto that uh, Mendel Grossman, he was a prisoner and he was an artist as I am before being a prisoner in the ghetto in Wuch. And he got a job as um, in the statistic department in the ghetto. So he was allowed to take photos. But besides those photos that he was asked to take, he took also his photos to testimony, to give testimony to witness that of what he was witnessing during those years. And he hid those photos or he gave some to some friends to be sure that they would survive. So that big image, the back represents a, a Mendel Grossman that he was witnessing what registering what was happening, imagining with Genevine and the children. So we can continue. Um, so we're gonna look at this two minute film, right? That uh, Mirta made to, to talk about this work that's part of our, um, that was part of the exhibition that we um, curated. And this has a little bit more of the story of this, um, of this image, and then we'll talk a little bit more. En el gueto de Lodz, sacaba fotos para dejar testimonio en caso de que él y todos los habitantes del gueto no sobrevivieran. Él quiso contar lo que sus ojos estaban viendo, pero en esta obra aparece como muy protagonista una foto que sacó otra persona, Walter Genevay, quien era el contador del gueto de Lodz y que estaba afiliado al partido nazi quien no tenía mucha intención de contar lo que estaba pasando, sino simplemente de hacer experiencias con sus, los nuevos rollos Axfa que aparecían, por eso aquí aparecen en la obra tantas tiras de color y demás. La pregunta es, ¿qué es lo que estaban viendo esos chicos mientras estaban siendo fotografiados? Como en un juego de espejos, quise dar vuelta a la escena y por eso inventé, creé esta espalda de los chicos y también esa sombra espectral que es la figura imaginada por mí de Mendel Grossman que está íntegramente escrita a mano con la intención de hacer tributo a su vida en el escrito se relata la vida de él y es el traer el aquí a la hora en mi mano actual la vida de Mendel Grossman pero hay algo más En el brillo de la lente de Walter Genevain aparece un rostro. Ese es el rostro de Mendel Grossman en una foto que él se sacó a sí mismo, casi una de las primeras. Y contarás a tus hijos, dice el presente. Y eso es lo que trato de hacer también. Okay, I'm going to go back to our, whoops. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, obviously, the size is very important also because the size includes all of us in the sense when you see it, it's not the same no. as to see it in the computer, but when you see uh, the size, uh, your real size inside that same uh, scenario also. So we'll go back to our PowerPoint and uh, so this is the image. You can see the yes. close up here. You go ahead, Pieta. Yes, yes. So okay. I don't know if it is clearly perceived, but the, the image, the, this photo is transformed into the shine that is on the lens that is not incorporated in the real space as the children, but it is, if you see the big one, you will not recognize it 
very easily. And it happens in the reality with Mendel Grossman. Nobody took him in account when he was there taking the photos. He just perhaps was walking because what we didn't mention is that he didn't take the photos like this. This was a selfie that he took from himself. He took his camera inside his pocket where he made a hole and uh, facing the camera from the pocket, he made the click from the, his pocket so nobody see, saw that he was taking actually a photograph. So perhaps in the ne next images, there you see I am writing, uh, and I must say that I made uh, some books, uh, each one made one by one based on this story, developing all this. This is the main one, this is the book. And each one in that big image that is this uh, unfold, it turns big. Uh, well, here you, this is Marianne and Leo's text with the transparent, um, page with the camera, this is, it represents um, the hole the, that he, slight, you, slot, slight, how do you say? Slit. 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 With a slit, thank you, he made, and I write my own feelings in the book. It is printed, but I am writing my own feel, uh, feelings in Spanish and English, and this is his eye, Mendel Grossman's eye inside his camera, inside the slit. So this is an imagined and not imagined, this is um, the, the face of the child is a real child, a real photo that he took. And this is the camera, the Leica camera that Mendel Grossman used. And this is an imaginary pocket that I made. So it is, let's say, a digital collage joining archives, real photo archives in a digital collage. Sorry, I have to mute myself here. You know, you know um, uh, Pablo Picasso used to say that art is a lie that helps to say, to tell the truth. And I think that this is really what, well, many artists we are doing. We are joining uh, things in this digital collage or drawing or saying to tell a truth. This photo is a real photo. He was, this one was one of the allowed photos. He was asked to take this photo of the de dead march in, a, a, in the Wuch ghetto. His assistant, Mendel Benarie, uh, took this photo from him. He was usually in the allowed, permitted photos like this. But in the other ones, he took his camera. He only had hanging the, um, the cover of the camera, but the real camera was in his pocket. This is everything inside the book. So one of the uh, big uh, images in the book I made also that is unfold, it is this one in the center is a photo that Mendel Grossman took of a carriage of his Jews inside the ghetto. They were, they were giving milk. They are all standing on his eye, the drawing that I made of his eye inside the camera. And the title I gave to this is Under the Line of Horizon. And the upper part is the texture that emulates uh, his coat. Well, this, is, uh, this was uh, something very curious for another talk because I found in, in these photos that I researched, I met here in Buenos Aires, someone that, that has uh, photos from uh, Mendel Grossman, and she didn't know that they were uh, uh, these photos were are from him. But I I research in the real archives in the libraries, and I told her because there were some copies, and I discovered that uh, Mendel Grossman took one photo of a Kupferling in the ghetto that married the one that gave this donation 
to the library. So, well, all a family moving around the world. This is also diaspora. And this is the end of the book where a black page uh, turns, it, it says testimonio para el testigo. For me, it's always important to work in, in Spanish also because this marks where I live. And um, afterwards says bearing witness in English, in English for everyone to be able to understand. And in the cover of the book, there is included in the cover a mirror. Uh, my glasses are not drawn. It is a mirror where everyone that is looking at the book will at the end be reflected, thus included as a witness in the book and in life. And this is the end. You see the importance of the camera lens here. So this is, you, you, you know, I just gonna say a few words and then maybe we'll open it up for discussion of work with archives that you've done, Mirta. And, you know, one of the big questions, certainly there's been a, you know, in the last 25 years, the critique of the archive and the power of the archive um, has in, in cultural studies has been so smart and interesting and important um who has the power what stories are told what uh what is included and what is ex excluded whose voices are excluded um has been you know really powerful questions from Foucault to Derrida downward um I think one of the things we've been talking about today is how to enlarge the archive and to include other stories but also the responsibility to tell you know stories that are accurate and truthful and the kind of research that Mirta has done that we've been trying to do to tell the story of this unknown camp, for example, that hadn't been written about, to tell the story uh, of the Woods Ghetto and those children and, and also to tell, to bear witness for the witness. I mean, one of the inspirations for the title of Mirta's work is the line from the poet Paul Celan, who will bear witness for the witness? How can we bear witness to the witnessing of somebody like Mendel Grossman. So then, um, so, so we have on the one hand, the responsibility to tell as truthful and accurate a story as possible. And on the other hand, the responsibility or the, the um, impulse or the desire or the need to repair something that has a texture of life that has been so terribly compromised and broken. And it, that, work of repair that I think Mirta has performed here, really like a gift to the past, um, a gift to these people who, most of whom did not survive, to these children who didn't survive. That work of love and repair requires taking great liberties with the archive. It requires Photoshop. It requires putting figures into the pictures who, who weren't there. It requires reversing the photos. It requires making something new out of those breaks. A little bit like that Kintsugi technique with the gold, but probably more so because it's not just cutting up and, re and putting back together again. It requires remaking. But where are the limits to that? You know, where do we stop with that? What, what, what kinds of liberties would we not want taken? with the archives of our ancestors. Um, so those are really big questions for me that I have not yet figured out and that perhaps we could talk about together. But maybe before we do that, Mirta, you'll tell us about your current work and I'll stop sharing now so we can all see each other better. Thank you, Maria. Based on this girl with the tree uh, that I prepared for the show, uh, School Photos and Their Afterlife, Afterwards, I could not stop thinking on it. I, and I am developing a video animation they, that, 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 girls, that girl continues walking that it's me. It's not just characters now, but it's me as a little girl that I felt that I was always at school everywhere with all my ancestors with me everywhere, with the language, with the different uses of food, of culture uh, at home. So, and that the, I think that this is a feeling that 
many of us living uh, in a different place from our ancestors uh, will have during many, many times be because we have a, a another one more uh, identity. I say another because uh, we don't forget, we cannot live what we are, but we have, of course, and thankful, the new identity of the local place also. That is why I work also, I mark the Spanish in my work also. So I am working now answering your kind question, Marianne, in a video animation drawing what is happening with this girl, with her previous feelings and the actual and future ones. And during the pandemic, because everything is happening inside my house, not my studio, inside my house during the lockdown, all the things that I am thinking and seeing walking inside my house. Well, it sounds amazing. I can't wait. Thank so you. thank you. Um, we'd love questions and the discussion and we'd love to see you. Thank you so much, Marian and Martha, for this enticing and engaging talk. Uh, but just uh, before we open the floor for the questions and discussions, I would just like to say that uh, we are going to upload all the talks of this Delhi Comparatist, and I'm going to share the link soon so that everyone can like go back and watch these talks. Uh, but now I open the floor for discussion. Uh, like participants can type the question so they can ask. Yeah, Ashri, I don't see anyone typing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's invite others to join the discussion. Okay. Yes, please do. Uh, okay. Mark. We'd love to hear how this relates to some of the work that you're all doing. If you want yeah. to share that, that would be so, great. So I, I just wanted to say that because I have a duty as the coordinator or mentor somewhat of this group to thank you at the end but I'm too overwhelmed. So I would like to share these thoughts with you. You know, my understanding of Holocaust started when I read uh, Anna Frank's diary when I was in class seven or eight in, my trans in, the translation, in a translation in my language. And today we are living in a country where um, detention camps are really Hmm. It's wonderful how you have understood the whole situation. Uh, pardon me if I become emotional because, uh, okay, I'm an Indian, a liberal humanist Indian. <laughs> so I have become. Hmm. I would really ask you any question right now. Because as I said, that my training started where I read in my school days, a translation of Anna Frank. And while Martha was talking about how do we understand, how do we deal, how do we scrutinize, then I remember when last year I was teaching to an English master's batch, the same autobiography or memoir. Mm, I had to talk about uh, how she understood. And okay, as a humanist, a liberal humanist, I had to underline those lines where she repeatedly said that, but human beings are good. With all she went through. Thank you. Now, when you are rewriting that, you are looking at that, in that repository, each of which photograph hearts us every moment, not as a Polish, not as a Romanian, not as a homosexual, but as a human being. You do this for a purpose with all that pain. Will one of you please talk up, talk to us about their journey of that pain and yet to talk about that? The journey, is that what you asked? <clears throat> well, I mean, it's fascinating that you bring up that line from Anne Frank. Um, 
because what I what I hear that line, I hear how it's been received and used sometimes as an alibi. Human beings are really good at heart. Um, the the role that Anne Frank's diary and then the play on you know on, in 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 the United States and then the reception of the book as the one book that everybody would read the story of this young girl. I mean, there's no question that Anne Frank was a, just a remarkable girl and writer, but the way her story has been appropriated to be the universal story is also a problem, you know, and um, that human beings are really good at heart was, it could be a way to whitewash a lot of crimes that have been committed and then um, complicities and implications of the Dutch and Germans and, you know, people that she, you know, people who um, actually exposed the family. I mean, there's so much and so that history is so rich. And it's very interesting that it's that line that has survived. And we have the question of gender and uh, things that were excised from the diary that her father censored because he didn't want to, her sexuality to be, you know, um, told and the, the different incarnations of the diary. And then this remarkable film, Anne Frank Today, or Anne Frank Remembered, of her friends who are these women in their 70s, uh, where you think like this was, this would have been Anne Frank Today if she had lived, but we think of her as the eternal 13 year old who's writing the diary. So there's so much in every one of these stories that can be used uh, and interpreted in so many different ways. So that's just the journey of this one story, right? But if we go back, I mean, to honor, you know, her as that girl, this is sort of what we try to do with this picture of the children in Woods, which is, let's not just look at it retrospectively in, in what happened and how we can, you know, use that story. Let's go back to that moment. And so, there's, a, there's an issue for me now in memory studies, which is memory is always in the present and we look back. Um, what if we go back to the past and try to look forward, not to look forward to the trajectory that actually happened, but what might've happened, what could have happened, what could have happened if people had acted differently. And I think pedagogically as a teacher, for me, that's really important to think of what could people have done? What can we still do? and not to see the kind of inevitability of this journey that leads us from there to here, where we only look back helplessly and say, well, this is what happened, you know, and, and we're seeing it and we're witnessing it now, you know, we're witnessing all these stories now. How can we intervene? What can we do? So this is really about, you know, sort of what, how I'm thinking of the journey. Uh, Shri, I know there are questions, but before that, I would just like to add, to Martha and Mariamis. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. What she responded right now. You know, yeah, uh, while talking about that edited version and the non edited version of Anna Frank's diary, where her father decided what should be there, and then the later version, what I find in both of you doing. Uh, so I remember that, uh, as I said, that after reading Anna Frank, in my school days, we decided for me what I would be later. Uh, yeah, that was the end of it. <laughs> so uh, I went to Poland, went to a teacher who teaches Bengali. She took me to the Polish Auschwitz. And for me, that was not a history into a journey into history. That was journey into my country. Mm. And today it is more visible. But what you are saying is also right. This uncritical acclaiming, acclamation is not something which can save us. We'll have to understand all the experiences critically. Mm -hmm. And that's where we will survive as human beings at the end of the day. If I have understood you, Proper. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, I want to add something. It is so interesting this conversation to me because I all also recall. Um, I am thinking that the interpretations of a text 
and of a, an image. It's a new, a, a new uh, journey. So we cannot know exactly the journey that we are planning because uh, um, only today, when Marianne said something about the boat that I am seeing there, she also said things that I didn't think spe specifically. And I will tell a story. Many years ago, I did a big mural, in, big installation that uh, it was done referring to Holocaust by chance. And I exhibited this in Buenos Aires that was clearly, uh, the, the title was to be a witness. And uh, it was shown in Buenos Aires and in New York and also in uh, Japan. And when people not in Argentina knew that I am Argentinian, immediately, immediately they uh, related that with the dictatorship in Argentina and not with Holocaust. So the way a, a text and an image uh, are read by others. Uh, in India, what I am uh, speaking now in India, I am sure is read differently as in Hungary, in US, in Argentina, or in Africa, or because the realities, the codes, the colors means different things. Uh, so, um, I think that we do not have, con we cannot have control of what will happen with what we produce. Uh, we cannot uh, calculate the journey. We can say uh, our voice and it is ours, but we cannot calculate those children in the photo never imagined that we are now in India, in Hungary, in the United States, and in Argentina, speaking about them. So um, we cannot control this. We, we must be, and uh, answering you, Amitabha, I think that what we can do, besides being critical, I would say to be very honest, very sincere with our work. And that is enough. True. And yeah, their work. And the rest of the people will do the rest. Oh, Shui, are you moderating questions or? Uh, yes, yes, I, I can read out the questions if that's okay with you. Or somebody may wanna ask it themselves. Uh, yeah, we have actually two questions as of yes, now, so. If we have only two questions, let, us, let the, those who are participating ask that. Uh, okay, sure. But uh, I think till the time they make their mind, I can read out these questions and we can continue okay, with the discussion. Do, okay, do because I, I want this discussion to like go on. Does do that. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I really don't want to like pause this uh, discussion and uh, wait, that's why. Uh, so, okay, uh, we okay. Have, okay. so we have our first question from Kanchi. She says, uh, she asks, how does material memory relates with sensory memory? especially in connection with post memory. Do future generations experience sensory memory when going through material memory? Uh, I ask this from a child's point of view who might have fled the war situation as a very young child. So do future generations have sensory memory? It's, it's really a great question. Um, so I, I guess I want, you know, for me, it all depends on how it's transmitted, right? And I think people transmit their memories um, in many different ways through telling stories. I mean, one of the tropes about survivors of the Holocaust is that they don't speak and they don't want to tell their stories. I have found that that's not true. And I think it's doing a disservice to people who really want to bear witness and want to tell stories. But how do they tell their stories? Um, when um, one of the iconic moments of this is in the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961, when Adolf Eichmann was brought to trial was the first public trial that was actually filmed and televised and people could see it and hear it. Um, and it was the first that brought witnesses and the witnesses told stories in court. I mean, the court was a particular way to transmit, of course. Um, and Hannah Arendt wrote this amazing book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she was really disgruntled with the witness testimonies because 
they told them in such unruly ways. I mean, some people just went on and on and on talking and trying to describe, and some people told, you know, fell apart on the stand and um, couldn't go on speaking. And she just did not think that that was a good way to, to tell the stories. People tell, people transmit through narrative, but they also transmit through behaviors, um, through the way they arrange their houses, through the food they cook, through the, um, the, the way they observe certain rituals, through how they raise their children. I mean, don't go out without a coat on, you're gonna catch cold. I mean, this fear of cold, the fear of draft, all of these things are part of how this is transmitted. So I feel like it's very sensory and you get it through the sensory. So in, in, um, in our book that we wrote, Ghosts of Home, there's a whole chapter on tile stoves. You know, the, I don't know if you have them in India, uh, stoves made out of tile that you heat with wood or, or eventually coal and how you touch it and how you can put food on it. And I mean, that is to me and going back to the city where my parents were from and being able to experience and touch the tile stove where they were during the war, where they had to, you know, um, in the ghetto and where they had to heat water on the tile stove and the stories that I had heard and then touching that object. I mean, that was very sensory. How that then comes down to us through the work of artists and writers, I think that can then transmit it to a larger, um, to a larger public because it's not, family memories are embedded in larger um, social and cultural moment. So, um, it's not only that uh, it, this transmission occurs in the family, the, the, the family is only one part, but then through film, through narrative, through literature, I mean, it, it then gets transmitted to a larger public and the family memory itself is shaped and, and inflected by the public images that also are circulating. So it goes both ways, but I think the sensory is very much part of what I think of as post-memory. Mirta, do you have thoughts about this? Oh, no, I, I, I agree with what you are saying. Yes, I, I think uh, every code that also we don't know, we try, uh, and also, as I said, where is, how is received? Um, for example, in, in India that I had the pleasure to visit, the, the codes and the transmission is so, so strong, as I understood that uh, over the years, so um, of course, uh, uh, memory and post memory and transmission, also the way you educate your children uh, in, in, you see in Latin America, in different countries, the education and the respect to parents, to ancestors is so different in one country from the other. So it depends um, and, and the worries you have uh, in, in the day. I remember once um, my father living in Argentina and I had a brother almost the same age that he passed. Uh, they be, uh, lived all the Holocaust together. So one story, they didn't say they were uh, siblings. And when I met my uncle in Israel, living in Israel, and I told him, and you leave this and this and tell me about this story. He was surprised and he said, oh, where do you know that? And I said, well, I asked my father, your children do not ask to you. And he answered, they have their own wars. So it's completely different the way I grew up from the same family as my cousins grew up in Israel. Uh, well, this is always an open question for me. I think there was also a question about nostalgia. Uh -huh. Diaspora and nostalgia, which is also a really, really interesting question. Uh -huh. And, you know, I don't know if you know that the wonderful book by Svetlana Boim, The Future of Nostalgia, um, uh -huh. and where she has two different um, types of nostalgia. One is reflective nostalgia and one is uh, restorative um, nostalgia, I think it's called. One is the effort to regain a past um, that probably didn't exist or never could have existed, but that we invent, right? That we imagine. But the other one is the reflective nostalgia that keeps continuing, that is really a reflection on nostalgia itself, 
And nostalgia can also be critical. I mean, critical of the present. It doesn't mean that you're idealizing a lost home that probably never was the way you remember it or you think it, 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 it was, but it could be a nostalgia that's critical of the present. That means, so it's not, you know, critical nostalgia I think is a really important aspect of nostalgic memory. So, um, you know, I don't see it as a, you know, I'm not critical of nostalgia as a, as a, as a sentiment. Um, as an affect, because it can play so many different roles in the present in relation to a past. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our third question from Shuva, ma'am. Uh, she says, uh, it reminded me of Janus Korsak and his direction of the performance of Tagore's play, The Post Office, by the children of an orphanage at the, um, at the Warsaw Ghetto. It is impossible to watch the play in the same way as we did before after knowing this uh, story of the performance. I wonder if your pardon video me, has- Pardon me, she, it was not about orphanage. It was about the play enacted by that person. When he knew that the kids will be sent to the killing machine guest chamber the next morning. It's not about orphanage. Uh, okay. In the orphanage, no? No, they would be, next day, they would be, it's a Polish story, right? The next right. day, they, those kids would be sent to be killed. And so that doctor decides to play their drama with them. Hmm. So I don't know the story, but it sounds amazing. So, um, and, and what is the what is the play about? What yeah, is the yeah. Tagor play it's about? about uh, okay, I'll add here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, no, actually, no, this was, uh, actually, he was, uh, he, he, uh, he, this, uh, the, the children were from an orphanage and they were actually, uh, they were about to be sent to a concent, uh, they were also in a concentration camp where also uh, um, uh, uh, this, uh, where also the person uh, with, I talked about, Korzak was there. And he was uh, he was a, a doctor, uh, a psychiatrist, and also well, he was also working with them. He could have been saved, and in, and he knew that the uh, children were about to die. And this story of by Tagore, this play by Tagore, it's about a boy who was who had been sick for a long time, and who had not been allowed to move out of his house. So he he would be sitting by the window talking to people outside and and he would be waiting for a letter from the post office which had been newly constructed before his house and finally what happened is that he is about to die and the and the king has apparently sent a messenger actually it is not a messenger but you know people enact this to make him to uh, to to sort of to but it 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 ends uh, it ends with the uh, with one does not see the child dying, but there are certain other elements. I'm sorry, just a minute. <laughs> and, uh, and so we have, um, so it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a relationship with death and uh, Kozak thinks that maybe the children would be able to accept death a little more easily if they were to enact this uh, play. And so he makes them, perform it. Uh, he, uh, he works with them. He makes them perform it. And uh, they invite a lot of people as well. But that night he writes in his diary. Uh, you know, they, 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 they all, I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm. But that night, Korzak writes in his diary that, you know, he is, he is, uh, he's extremely despondent. He's not, he's not in that mood, really. So there is that there, but then uh, the, the children and soon the children are led to the concentration camp to die. And also along with them, Kozak leaves with them as well. So it's, you know, it's a very different, it had been a very different play for all of us. And, um, but then after knowing this story, you know, one cannot see Dagkar again, I mean, without having that in one's uh, memory. So it's a uh, it's a kind of it has been a, 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 a transformation of the entire play and the experience of the entire play for an entire generation of people. 
Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for your uh, presentation and for all that you showed. The, the image of the children remind me very strongly of those, those other children whom we had never seen, but you know, whom we had not really imagined. But you know, they sort of, I mean, did something to, to, to our memories as well. Ashubhadi, can I add to this conversation, please? Yeah, sure, sure, please, Amitabh. You know, this story always reminds me of another thing. That uh, when Marx wrote that religion is the opium of common people, we always uh, misinterpreted that, forgetting that opium was at his time used for terminally ill patients. Don't you think Kozik played Dagger as the opium for those kids? See, that is true. Uh, I think it, it was the experience was so real for them. And you know, the experience was so real for him. I mean, there was no, it, it wasn't a question of an opium. He just wanted to do something with the children. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to sort of reconstruct all that he had thought because it was a different kind of situation altogether. Yes, but my other question to you was, apart from this, that I was wondering, because the story never ends. So I was wondering about the reception to your, your video, your talks, et cetera, that you've been holding your exhibitions. And if there has been any other, you know, other kinds of uh, digital expressions or any other kinds of uh, expressions in writing, taking up the stories that you are projecting. Uh, this is... Or in general, you know, other reactions to your uh, to, to your conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, oh, thank sorry, you. I'm sorry, my video was off. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, if you ask, hi, hi, hi. So. hi. Sorry, I, I didn't. Well, know if, it, if it is about me, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you are very committed with one in one situation many doors or some doors open to you and is many doors also close to you because many people are not interested at least uh, in Argentinian um, artistic uh, landscape of Jewish issues or Holocaust stories or memories. Well, uh, everyone has his his tribe, you know, where to move. Memory studies uh, are very interested and I am surprised how many scholars from many different uh, places in the world get in touch with me. I am amazed, but I cannot believe that uh, words can reach so many different places. And uh, well, but Again, uh, what I say to Amitava, when you are completely honest and you are who you are and you, uh, you are placed and standing on your feet, uh, you know, I, I am also not interested in everything in, in life. So I can, of course, accept and understand that some people are interested in my work and some not, of course. But um, I am not working uh, to gain fame, you know? I am working because I cannot not say what I am saying. So uh, I have no worries about that. And I am not thinking on who will like it. Yes, yes, I am many times awakened I, as a, a by scholars as Marianne, and others that they write or speak or say or show something that opens a door for me. But this is because we have also perhaps before meeting each other, a connection of interest in life. And well, I don't know if I answered your questions. Yeah, yes, yes, of course you did. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, that was a great way of answering my question. Thank you. And Suba, thank you for sharing that story about Korshak. I mean, he was amazing. As you said, he, he yeah. could have survived, but he insisted on accompanying the children. Yeah. And right. um, 
but I did not know the story of the post office and the play that the children enacted um, the night before they were deported. And that's amazing because it's amazing that, that he chose that play that comes from a completely other part of the world and that that play could enable them. And I think it's really also the power of, of art and of performance, really an embodied performance to what it did for them, we cannot know, but we can know that um, doing something together as a community uh, to, to, to enact that play and the performance and have other people come and bear witness to that um, must have done something. And I don't know about the opiate of the people. I think it, um, if it could ease that evening where, and their fear and find a figure in that other little boy in the post office, right, waiting for the message, um, that message is open-ended. I mean, I don't think he was feeding no. them anything specific. No. No. He was allowing them, he, he was giving them a vessel in which they themselves, that they themselves can fill with what comes from them, right? right. Um, and that's an amazing gift. I mean, it's, it's totally yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's right. Thanks Thank for you sharing so much. that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have our next question from Kanchi. Uh, do you think the ever evolving technologies, the term used by clean uh, temper or enhanced memories as passed down uh, generations? Uh, and the second part is like with the fear of memories replacing history. So do the, do the ever evolving technologies temper or enhance memories that are passed down? Technologies are, I mean, evolving so fast. And so, um, so I guess I would answer that question with the latest, um, I don't know how many of you know about <clears throat> the, the Shoah Foundation archives uh, that Steven Spielberg, um, sorry, my screen just did something weird. Okay. Um, that Steven Spielberg started when he made Schindler's List and then he started interviewing survivors across the world and he has 50,000 um, testimonies, but also has started doing interviews in Rwanda and uh, you know, in, in other parts of the world. Uh, so an amazing archive that's the late, you know, was the latest in technology. And then um, there are, you know, they're archived by the minute. So you, by subject, so you can find, you know, and find a lot of information and, and the voices. Um, but then they started making um, these hologram. Um, do you know, does people know about this? So yes. um, they chose uh, several survivors who are very, very good storytellers. They interviewed them for many, many hours, like 15, 20 hours and asked lots and lots of questions. So that then um, through a kind of um, technology like Siri, right? They appear and, and I, on video, but in a kind of 3D videography and they're, in, it, they're interactive. So you can ask them questions like, what's your first childhood memory? What's the first song you learned? Or tell me about your kindergarten or something like that. And the computer will generate an answer that's totally from their previous answers, but the computer puts together a response. Um, so, um, does that enhance memory? Does it weaken? Does it replace history? How do we feel about this technology? I did experience some of these characters or people. I mean, they, I can talk to them now, but some of them have, have already died. So it's a kind of posthumous encounter. Um, is it different from just listening to the testimony on video? listening and watching the testimony on video. Yes, because it's interactive. So it's their um, imagination of what um, younger people will want to do that it has to be interactive rather than just a listening experience. Uh, I'm worried about it. I don't know how other people feel about these technologies. Um, so that to me is one example of how technology is shaping. And of course it's always shaped how history comes down to us. Is it, whether it's the tape recorder Real to real, the tape, you know, the, the cassette tape, the videotape, the film, the um, written down, um, uh, the audio tape uh, or the video. I mean, all of these technologies shape how history comes down to us, whether it's oral history, right? All of those. 
Um, but this, this is sort of the latest that um, I have to say gives me a little bit of anxiety. Um, so I only have questions, not I, answers for this. No, very interesting. Sorry that I am speaking, but I, um, that is, is such a good example that you gave. I think I feel a little, a little uncomfortable. It's like, you know, hey, Google, you ask to tell a joke to say it's the same. And uh, I, am, I am a little bit worried. Uh, I love technology. We could not be together if not thanks to technology. But I have a question also with this because out of context, uh, this is not archives, uh, the, this figure speaking. I think that it's better to hear an old testimony in an old film, film made to be a, to be maintained through the through time, I'm also a little bit. It's, it's, it's a little bit scary. It's a siniestro in Spanish. A little bit sinister. Little bit for me. Uh, we have our next question from Keisha. Uh, looking at archive as a site of a, a contestation of POVs of perpetrator, witness, victim, and even the reader, what kind of strategies can one employ to reconcile these various viewpoints for developing a more enlarged, broad representation? Um, yeah. So you said the kind of work that the 1947 partition archive is doing, and I, I don't know enough about that. I would like to hear about that. You know, so first of all, can we enlarge the categories of points of view? So um, I would say perpetrator, witness, victim, uh, what kinds of witnesses? Uh, bystanders, rescuers, implicated subjects in the words of Michael Rothberg, his latest book, The Implication, Complicity. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different points of view that kind of shape these archives. And uh, I don't, you know, in that shape that, through, and that they're also, of course, shaped through the technologies through which they're, they're um, first captured and then, and then transmitted. Um, and I don't know if I would want to reconcile the various viewpoints or try to just lay, try to do the research to label how they were produced, how these objects were produced. I think there's a lot we cannot do without perpetrator archives or without colonized colonizers archives because they provide a lot of information, but how we deal with them, you know, how we receive them should be shaped by how they were produced, right? But that doesn't mean that they can't be used. And one of my big questions in my earlier work on Holocaust memory was how come um, photographs produced by perpetrators through what I called a Nazi gaze, which is a kind of exterminationist gaze, are used by victims to memorialize the history. And I found that there, were, there have been various strategies used to mitigate or to reframe or to redirect the gaze. And I think Mirta's work that she talked about today is one really good example of that, that you can, you can re, you know, reorient them. But there are many, many ways and we, we cannot do without them, but we need to know what they are. So I don't know what the work of the 1947 Partition Archive is doing. I'd love to know more about that. Um, Sanchi, would you like to talk about Yeah, that? They're, they're actually uh, interviewing, uh, uh, you know, survivors of the 1947 partition that happened in British India, like in uh, when Pakistan was created out of British I know about the partition, just not about the archive. Yeah, so they are documenting survive, uh, the survivors of uh, the partition, and they're right now they are documenting the first generation, uh, the the ones who witnessed the partition firsthand, and right. soon I, I think they're going to start very soon uh, documenting the second uh, generation as well because you know they are also growing in age, so. Uh, they're like they've documented a lot of, and this is happening uh, in. Uh, in association with Stanford University Library. So they are documenting, oh, right. and uh, they are like you were talking about Steven Spielberg's archive. So they are also documenting on camera. So they, they are, uh, right from the beginning, where were they born and did they migrate when the partition happened? So everything uh, related to that. 
and are they um and how are they reconciling the points of view oh they have actually this they, are, they actually encourage uh, the volunteers or the citizen historians they call the people who are interviewing these people as citizen historians so they you know uh, they encourage those people to write blogs about uh, the partition survivors that they have interviewed uh, they have interviewed and also uh, they are reconciling as in they've actually made a uh, few people that i know of have actually been able to revisit or um, uh, get in touch with people that they left behind on either side of the border that was created mm. great it's I taken a long time to make these archives it's taken a very long time to begin this archive of these oral histories Yes, so actually, one of the participants has shared the link to the archive, so we can all right. have a look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. May I ask another question, please? Uh, sure, ma'am. No, I'm really fascinated by your use of the term "post memory." I was wondering if you are if you are also thinking of forgetting in in the context of memory because uh, victims of trauma often do not remember the worst moments. And uh, so, is, 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 so is there any thought that, uh, that you have on this issue of forgetting in the context of memory and in the context of coming back to life, probably? Uh, we, we couldn't remember anything without forgetting. I mean, it, you yeah, know, there's true. a wonderful story by Borges, Funes the Memorials, he just remembers everything and he's completely paralyzed, right? So forgetting is an essential part of, of life, really. Um, but of course, forgetting can play so many different functions. It can be um, just a self-preservation. I mean, you need to forget, right? And uh, you need to repress and, you know, the, from a psychoanalytic standpoint, forgetting is, is so important. But there's forgetting, there's amnesia, but then there's also willed forgetting, like denial in these painful histories, right? Um, and so memory is, there's nothing straightforward about memory and forgetting is just part of the very texture of it. And certainly as it comes down, it's more and more shaped by certain moments or you know, the, the moments that were photographed, the moments that were written down, there are others that you know have disappeared completely, so it's totally imbricated in the process of memory. Forgetting is just part of it, and probably there's way more forgetting than there's remembering. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may ask uh, one question, uh, because when I was, um, I mean, currently I work on diaspora and routing and rerouting. So when I when I was uh, seeing the picture of the people on boat with their trees, like carrying their trees, so I was wondering, like, can someone actually unroot their like roots, or is it like only the only they can carry the cultural traits uh, and not their roots? Uh, thank you. <coughs> I think that um, first, of course, it depends of uh, each person. But I think that uh, what the roots are, the roots are the culture, what Mariana said, the food, the transmitting, everything are your roots, not the land of the, or the tree. And what about the, your deads, the, the dead people that you live somewhere else and you will never be able, what's the importance or not importance of the cemeteries and the body of the corpse of, well, I think it's very personal. <clears throat> I think that uh, we can uh, uh, travel with our roads. And I think that the proof is what all of us are doing because Marianne is in some place with the roots uh, very as neighbors of mine <clears throat> Sorry, I live in Argentina, and although I am quite local, I have my roots, my, um, my more roots, because if I would live, if I were living now in India, I would have my Jewish and my Argentinian and my European roots. So I think, yes, you carry, you embody your roots. 
I think that each one of us, we are also roots. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, Amitabha, uh, should we take like more questions or? Uh... Are there uh, more questions? There's one question I can see from Yasmina. Uh, so uh, there is only one question. Let us take that and then I think uh, this time we can see. Okay. So the, uh, she says, uh, do you think that historical justice is the way to let go of collective traumatic past? Uh, or do you think that the past will always be a part of people's present and future lives? Mm, that's a great question. All your questions have been great questions. It's a hard one. Um, do we do this historical justice may mean we let go? Can we, but what is justice? You know, um, letting go by itself, as we know, you know, I live in the United States. So we're just haunted right now of the past of, um, the genocide against indigenous peoples here that it's never been worked through, has never been really truly acknowledged, and the legacies of enslavement of African peoples. Um, and we see the after effects of this uh, in every, you know, in how the pandemic has affected certain populations so much more than others uh, because of poor health care, because of uh, generations of lack of work and of uh, inequality and injustice. Can we let go of these pasts? No, I think if we, if we, we've tried to let go, I think, believe me, this country has tried to let go by not confronting it and the past keeps back and haunting us. So yes, I think the past, these painful pasts are with us until we acknowledge and we try to perform some kind of repair or reparation. And reparation has to be on so many different levels. Um, and I think um, it's very important to keep, um, to keep working on it. Um, but uh, there are museums, there are memorials, there is uh, economic reparation, there, is, um, there are different forms of, of, of justice, of, of transitional justice that work. I think one of the main ones is something that I think we've been trying to do here, which is to to tell the stories, to listen to the stories, but it's not enough. We really have to uh, acknowledge the wrongs that have been done, take responsibility, accountability, and then perhaps we can move forward as a community together. What does it mean to be a community together after a, in, in relationship to these histories? So right now I'm working on a large uh, project that we're applying for money for, just here in upper New York City and upper Manhattan and Washington Heights and the Bronx. Uh, and it's called the zip code memory project. So we're divided into zip codes, you know, the little number you put at the end of an address, which is like the little region that the post office uses. But the whole pandemic, everybody was checking their zip code to see what is the transmission rate in my zip code. If I just stay in my zip code, am I safe? Well, in where I live, you know, near Columbia University, it was always kind of pink or, or light orange. If you go north, just two zip codes, it's bright red and brown because those are the people who are delivering the food, who are working in the meatpacking plants, who are you know do the essential workers. Um, how do we live together in this area of these dif differential losses of the pandemic and what kind of memory practices can we event invent, can we, Form so that we can um, we can look uh, forward to a future together where we acknowledge these inequalities and these differences. So that's sort of my current project. So moving on, I mean, we're not through the pandemic yet. We're already thinking of the future, but don't we have to stop and take stock of what happened and how it's affected us so differently? Mirta, what do you think about letting go of the past? No, I think uh, that we cannot and we do not have to. I think it's very important uh, to have it present, not as, um, not as a trauma. We want not as a trauma, but yes, not allowing because this denial sometimes of a past or many countries, contemporary situations, contemporary governments that want to deny or to wash their hands in responsibilities, uh, we must not allow that because this 
permits new new apparition of things that I think that we must speak about this, we must do actions about what happened. And this may be a way um, to, to move uh, in reference of what we must not allow anymore. I think it's very important. And what you are saying, Mariane, about your new project, it is so, uh, so clear when you explain that because this happens in all our different worlds in the world, what happens in the different areas. And we think uh, that the, some people are, of course, they have to do the, their work, but uh, some of us live in privileged places. And well, I think it's a fabulous uh, project that takes account of all that the inequalities that are uh, even more uh, marked and seen in this pandemic world. There are some countries that have no vaccines at all. In Africa, no, some countries have no vaccines yeah. at all. Many, many people from Argentina are traveling to the US, but what many people, who? So, uh, well, um, our problems do not end. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you thank so you. much. Now I would like uh, to request Amitabh to give his ending and thank you note. Oh, uh, well. <clears throat> Well, Marda and Marianne, if you pardon me and the other participants, because, uh, you know, usually when I attend these uh, daily companies webinars, and also a few other webinars, uh, it's usually talking an academician talking to other academicians who do things, looking at grants, looking at positions or promotions or just for their own interest. But I'm so thankful to Srimoyi that she invited you. I'm thankful to her and both of you because uh, you see, what you have never tried in this whole lecture is to sound a scholar about memory and post-memory. You have tried to communicate yourselves what you are dealing with. And I think at this juncture of history, that's most, that's the most, that's of the most importance. You know the political situation in most of the Eastern European countries. You know what US has gone through. And I know what India is going through. Every moment we are afraid of another Holocaust. If not that concentrated, if it is concentrated, then we'll name it. But we know of the world history where Holocaust is going. It's a long-term process that is happening. I respect your research because it is not about your scholarship. It's about your commitment to a better future. And that's why it reminded me of Anne Frank. With all the scholarly things that we can say, you can say, both of you can say, the pages which are blurred, the diary which was found later, the pasted pages which are later found through lasers. We know all of this. We know that we can use that cultural capital to get another grant to enchant our speakers with our scholarships. But yeah, beyond that, you have chosen a path where it doesn't matter. What matters is the commitment. Like you might have seen that, you know, in India during partition, partition, we killed each other. The British didn't kill us. We killed each other and the total amount of death was more than the total amount of death that happened in Second World War in Europe. 
and we don't have an archive. We don't have a museum. Yeah, at least at that point, we should respect Europe. That if you go to Poland, your friend will take you to those places. If you go to Germany, each school student is supposed to visit those spaces. So Europe reminds its citizens of the history of cruelty that it had unleashed unto itself. We Indians don't do that. We are much better than that. So our history doesn't talk about how much, how many people we killed. Today I was having a class with my research students. So I told them, you know, you remember all the British names who led the forces which killed Indian freedom strugglers. But post-colonials don't tell you that they were all supported by Indians. The gun was, the command was at the hand of the British, but the gun was at the hand of the Indians. So memory or post-memory, we can juggle with ideas. We have all read our Foucault and our Derrida. But there are moments in life, in history, when we have to decide whether we will survive as the juggling academician or we'll just work for a better humanity. You know, <laughs> yeah, pardon me, I'll become a bit emotional. <laughs> You know, Indian civilization, Indian, I, any of the Indian state, Pakistan, India, or Bangladesh has not remembered what they did to each other during partition. They simply killed each other. They don't have a museum of that. <clears throat> the archive starts in 2019-2020. I have followed the link. Yeah, this late we are starting. And that's also not a government-funded project. And I have gone through the founders. I'm not very sure who are they. But if I look at Europe, if I look at that Polish friend of mine who will take me to that Auschwitz, who will take me to that place where a lot of Polish officers were killed, she is not narrating a story to me. She tells me that their school students used to go. I mean, Poland has changed in the last 15 years. The government has changed. So I think apart from this jugglery between ontological and epistemological issues of memories and post-memories, what both of you are doing is trying to remind us that as human beings, we could be as cruel as anything could be. But as human beings, throughout civilization, we have proved that, yeah, we are beyond that as well. I'm so thankful to both of you. You have okay. really granted me a new inspiration to live. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amitava. That's very moving. Very yeah. moving. Thank and hopefully we can put our scholarship to work. Yeah, let's do to, that. To, to build a better world too. Yeah, sure. And that's what means, I mean, otherwise, why this cultural capital? Yep. The best exactly. scholars were participant in the Nazis parties, right? <laughs> so let's go beyond that. I'm so thankful. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Shri, and all of you. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thanks to all the participants for their questions and the suggestions and the comments that we got. Thank you. Okay, bye. Lovely to bye, meet bye. you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'll bye. end the meeting now, but we will really want to hear from you once again. Cool. Maybe so. in person sometime, right? So yeah, sure. Cool. sure. That would be nice cool. too. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your Thank closing you. comment. It's very moving. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm closing the meeting now. Sure.